So once again, welcome everyone. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker this evening. This is actually the second program that we've had so far this year in our series. It is commemorating the, um, the centennial of the suffrage movement. And uh, this particular speaker, I, I contacted a number of months ago and I was really crossing my fingers that she was gonna be available and luckily she was. We were discussing a little earlier, she's doing a number of talks um, and I think there was one just very recently in Thomaston. So uh, keep your eyes out on the newspapers. You may be able to um, enjoy more of her conversation if you like this one. So Anne B. Gass speaks regularly on Florence Brooks White House and women's rights. She serves on the steering committee of the Maine Suffrage Centennial Collaborative and, on, and as the Maine coordinator for the National Votes for Women Trail, a project of the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites. She also serves on Maine's Permanent Commission on the Status of Women. So thank you again, Anne, so much for being here tonight. I'm really looking forward to this. I turn the show over to you. All right, well, thank you, Julia, for setting this up I, and uh, for everybody else for being willing to do this on, on Zoom. It's, uh, my, my experience is it's way more fun to do it in person, but sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, so I'm gonna start, go ahead and share my screen now. Um, There we go. And because I'm hoping everybody can see that. And, yes, uh, it looks good. Looks okay, good. Okay, good. I'm going to start uh, with a poem and uh, well, just introduce it by saying that it was a poem that Florence, um, my great grandmother, wrote. I, I'm not sure exactly when she wrote it, but I know that in 1917 she recited it uh, in front of the Judiciary Committee of the Maine State Legislature. Um, the occasion was they were lobbying for uh, the legislature to approve a statewide suffrage referendum. Now, Florence had really intense blue eyes, and I, I like to imagine her standing there and looking at all these men, because of course they all would have been men then, and um, looking at them in the eye and saying, I have no quarrel with you, but I stand for the clear right to hold my life my own, the clean, clear right to mold it as I will, not as you will, with or apart from you, to make of it a thing of brain and blood, of tangible substance and of turbulent thought. No thin gray shadow of the life of man, your love, perchance, may set a crown upon it, but I may crown myself in other ways, as you have done who are one flesh with me. I have no quarrel with you, but henceforth, this you must know. The world is mine, as yours, the pulsing strength and passion and heart of it, the work I set my hand to, women's work, because I set my hand to it. So I, I just love that poem. I, I think it ca really captures the essence of who Florence Brooks Whitehouse was. Uh, she was a writer and a poet. Um, she was an activist in a number of different fields. Um, she was a devoted wife and mother. Um, she was, a, a, she had a fine soprano voice and she was a, an amateur artist. Uh, um, so she was a person who did indeed set her hands to many things over the course of her long life. Um, my goal tonight is to introduce you to Florence and to the work she did to bring women's suffrage to Maine. It grew out of her work in the progressive movement in the early 20th century. I'm proud to say she was my great grandmother and I hope as Mainers, you'll be proud of her too. Um, she was, uh, we, we had her inducted into the Maine Women's Hall of Fame in 2008 for contributions to women's civic and social equality. But prior to that, um, she was really forgotten because uh, she was considered by her suffrage, a lot of her suffrage peers in Maine to be too radical. And so when they wrote the history of suffrage in Maine, they simply left her out or tagged her as a fringe character who was, you know, kind of caused more trouble than, um, than she helped. And my extensive research demonstrated to me that's simply not true. Um, so um, she's also the subject of my book, which is called Voting Down the Rose, Florence Brooks White House in Maine's Fight for Women's Suffrage, uh, which you can find on Amazon and also at Maine Authors Publishing and uh, from me directly. Um, so I'm gonna, attempt to, uh, oh, here we go, move things along here. Um, I just did want to mention that 
Um, I, I did extensive research on this, as I said. Uh, I started with the Maine Historical Society because my aunt donated seven boxes of papers to the Historical Society. And, um, and so they have them there now. You could, anyone can go through them. I also uh, got a lot of information from the Library of Congress. Um, and I looked at newspapers from Portland, um, the Lewiston Journal and the Kennebec Journal as well from 1914, 1920. And I read extensive suffrage Maine and US history. So I really, um, I really did it, made a, a, an effort to make sure that I, I covered as much ground as possible so that I could understand what it is that she did and, and the context in which she was acting and, and made, had to make the decision she made. Um, okay, so here she is, another view of her. Um, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about her, her childhood and, um, and, and her early adulthood because I think that does help shed some light on why she became, I think, Maine's most effective suffrage activist later on. Uh, she was born in, in Augusta in, um, in 1869, and uh, here was the house that she grew up in. Um, it was, uh, it, it's still there. I've, I've been by it, um, 7 Spruce Street. Um, this is her dad, Samuel Spencer Brooks. Um, he was, uh, he owned a hardware store on, on um, Water Street in Augusta. He was a successful businessman, and he also dabbled in shipbuilding. And he was able to keep the, the family in some comfort. Um, there were five children, and she was the fourth of the five in the family's first girl. Um, here's uh, her uh, sister, her younger sister, Daisy, and um, her mother in the middle. It was Mary Caroline Wadsworth Brooks. And so she had some connection to the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow family as well and that may have sparked Florence's early interest in writing I we don't really know for sure um, now the the, um, the White Houses were among the early families to buy into what has become a flourishing summer colony on Squirrel Island off of Boot Bay Harbor and I, I love this photo because it um, it just you know we tend to think of our our politicians and leaders as being these very staid, conservative looking people. And we forget that once they were young and, and goofing around. And so that's kind of what's happening in this picture. That's her brother, Percy, on the far right. And she's, he's kind of cranking her chin around, I think, to make her look at the camera. Um, and they're on Squirrel now. Next to Florence is the man who becomes her husband, Robert Treat Whitehouse. And I, I don't know who the mutton chop sleeves is. I keep hoping somebody will identify her for me, but isn't that a costume to be wearing in a Maine summer? Um, so she went to public schools in, um, in Augusta, and then she later went to the St. Catherine's Hall, which was a finishing school affiliated with a Episcopal church. Um, she did not go to college, although I think she could have. She was certainly, uh, you know, the family could have afforded it. And what she did instead was to, in 1892 and 1893, she took an extended trip abroad to Europe, the Holy Land, the art centers of Syria and Egypt, which were um, very popular uh, among Europeans and, and um, Americans around that time, uh, you know, especially uh, Syria and Egypt, they had a real fascination for them. She spent an entire winter going up and down the Nile River, um, sailing up and down the river there. The family myth is that um, she had that, that she had a, some sort of romance um, with some man, gentleman over in, in Egypt, and that Robert, who had quite a fondness for her, sailed for Egypt and brought her home. Uh, I don't know if that's true. I've never been able to verify that, but I, I I think what I'm sure of is that if she hadn't wanted to come home and marry him, she wouldn't have done it. Um, she had definite ideas about what she wanted to accomplish. In fact, prior to taking this extended trip abroad, she'd spent several winters in Boston studying art, drawing, music, and languages, and that was another way that she furthered her education. But she she found her own tutors to, to work with and rather than going to college, where I think she would have been somewhat confined. But she does come back in 1894 and um, and marries Robert Treat Whitehouse, and they have a great um, relationship. They he's uh, I should actually I'm going to back up just a bit. Um, Robert uh, was the son of the Chief Justice of the Maine Supreme Court, William Penn Whitehouse. Uh, he also grew up in Augusta. I think they'd probably known each other from childhood. Um, his his 
family still also had ties to Squirrel. Um, he later went to Harvard and to law school and, and became a lawyer like his dad. Um, so they they moved to Portland and they they have an awful lot of fun there while they're you know in their first year or two while they're kind of uh, getting to know Portland and they they uh, each get involved in in lots of different things there. Florence joins the Rossini Club, which is a music club, and uh, started a writers club. And they also collaborated on writing and and um, producing and acting in plays. Uh, which they performed for charity up and down the coast of Maine from Portland, you know, what's now Merrill Hall Auditorium um, up to Boot Bay Harbor and, and, um, and Squirrel. And so they did a number of those and, and those, some of those were based on her travels in, in the Holy Lands and, and, um, and in Syria and Egypt. And, and she ends up, um, once the kids came along it would, and he got more busy with his, his private practice, um, they they decided that, uh, you know, I, I, he finally says to her, you know what, you're such a good writer, why don't you just adapt your plays into novels? And and so that's what she ends up doing. And this is the first one, The God of Things, um, which was published in 1902, I think. And uh, she also did these very fine illustrations that are part of the book, uh, that are sort of, you could find them throughout the book. And um, it was published by Little Brown and Company to great um, reviews for the most part and um, was her, for her first work it was quite well received um, and she ended up publishing a second book called The Effendi in 1904 um, and she was on bed rest with the, my, what turned out to be my grandfather um, was that book was coming to the finish so they hired some other artists to, to do the illustrations in that one. Um, so um, here they are actually the young family there's Florence and um, uh, the, the, on her, on the upper right is uh, my my grandfather Brooks Whitehouse, and then um, on the lower right, um, well, I'm thinking Florence's upper right, I should say, is is Brooks, and then um, down below Brooks is Robert Treat, the middle child, and William Penn is 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 the eldest. Um, so they're they're you know they've got this sort of magical life, lots of great things happening for them, and then. In, uh, in 1908, Brooks comes down with polio, which was, of course, absolutely devastating. He was very ill, um, and she just dropped everything and nursed him back to health. And, and um, in, in those days especially, and we still see it today, actually, women tend to be the nurses and caretakers of their families. But she was determined that he would not lead an invalid's life. Um, that he would be able to walk again, even though the doctors doubted it. And so, and he eventually did. He um, he recovered. He went to Harvard also, and and uh, became an attorney. And um, and he was able to play tennis and hunt and do all kinds of things that he would not have been able to do if he hadn't had such a determined mother. So what's interesting is that I have her journals, and and they end in 1908, and they don't start again until 19. Uh, 13 when she starts getting involved with suffrage and I think that's sort of an indicator of just how she dedicated she was she didn't do anything else while she was making sure that Brooks was all right um, so I'm gonna um, so that's her background so she's a writer she's she's comfortable on stage um, she's really good at, at managing her time um, and uh, she's got a very supportive husband so this is a picture of Florence when she's just getting active in suffrage, I think around 1913. Um, and so what she did was she joined the main affiliate of the National American Woman Suffrage Association. And I'm gonna do a quick tutorial here because not everybody knows this history. Apologies if you do, but um, the NASA, as the acronym was, was pronounced, um, favored a state-by-state -state approach. It was this sort of creaky old battleship of an organization, had been around for decades. Um, and they really were trying to get as many states as possible to approve suffrage for women um, with a long-term goal of passing an amendment to the, <clears throat> to the U.S. Constitution. But th along the way, they favored a kind of non-confrontational, non-political, incremental approach. And so here the president's, um, when she first joined was Dr. Anna Howard Shaw, and then later Carrie Chapman Capp took over in, in, in 1915. 
<clears throat> so that's where she starts. And, and because of her background, she's actually quite good. At, at, um, and she's the rising star of the Maine Women's Suffrage Association, which was the Maine affiliate. Um, she quickly started, a, uh, she had a weekly suffrage column in the Lewis and Journal. Um, she did all kinds of debates and organized letter writing campaigns. She becomes chair of the legislative committee and starts pressing for uh, a, a, a suffrage referendum in Maine, which they narrowly miss getting in 1915 and later achieve in 1917. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So everything's going great. Uh, and then sort of along the back, you know, in the background here is the Congressional Union gets formed. Um, and the Congressional Union was this, you know, think of it as a, you know, in, in, in Silicon Valley terms, a, a disruptor. It was a dis young, uh, disruptive organization. Federal, the Federal Amendment was their sole focus, and they were willing to use controversial methods like picketing um, and like holding the political party in power accountable for failing to pass the, to move the suffrage amendment through Congress. Um, the way they're going to do that is that because of NASA's success over the years, there are now 4 million women voters. They all happen to live west of the Mississippi, um, but there's 4 million of them. And if they can be persuaded to vote as a block, they can determine the outcome of the presidential election in 1916. So that's what they're aiming for. And um, they get started in, in sort of 1912, 1913. And, um, and in 1915, they come looking, they come to Maine and they're looking for, um, they're looking to start a, a new suffrage affiliate in Maine. And they end up choosing Florence to be the chair of the Maine branch of the Congressional Union, what later becomes the National Women's Party. And um, so here's Alice Paul, who was the, the president of the, of the CU, the, who really founded it, on um, Lucy Burns, who was her co-founder. So you can see, you know, you think about it in today's terms, which of these would be more likely to have a social media strategy, you know, or something like that. You know, you can see why these are younger women, They're, they've come up at a different time and they have different ideas about what is appropriate for women to do. And they are tired of waiting for, the federal amendment, they're gonna make it happen. <clears throat> so um, here's a great uh, illustration of their, of their strategy of, of harnessing the votes of all these 4 million women voters all living in the West, coming to the, the, you know, you can see this woman of glory from the West striding across the country, coming to the aid of, of her benighted uh, sisters in the East who are in the black pit of despair reaching out to her for, for help. Um, so that's that's you know from this period this this graphic was was created. Um, I'm gonna do uh, oh I just wanted to point out that um, Florence's husband Robert Treat Whitehouse was was super supportive. Uh, the one thing he never wanted her to do was to be arrested. He just kind of put his foot down over that. Um, so she did a lot of other things, and he was. Uh, he, one of the things he did was to create the Men's Equal Suffrage League, uh, which he chaired from 1914 to 1920. Um, so I, I did want to make sure, because sometimes I forget to mention that, but he was, he was very supportive. Uh, here's a photo of her press photo for the, not, for the Congressional Union um, around the time that, that she got involved. And um, this is a bit of an aside, but I, I, there's a lot of criticism um, of the early suffragists or the suffragists from 100 years ago and, and earlier about how racist they, they were. And while it's not entirely um, incorrect to say that, it, it, they had a big dilemma, which was, you know, they've been working on, they were now in the third generation of women who've been working to try to pass, you know, to, to enfranchise all women across the country. And um, there's a big problem because, of course, the southern states don't want that to happen. And they have to be really careful about how they talk about that. And so here's an example of Florence has reached out to a, a U.S. Senator from Maine, Charles Johnson, in 1915, and um, asked him whether or not he supports a federal amendment. And he tells her, you know, I am in, I am in favor of statewide suffrage, but not an amendment to the Constitution of the United States, which would force women's suffrage upon states which do not desire it. 
the state of Mississippi has a white population of about the same size as the state of Maine, but in addition, it has 1.2 million Negro population. So, um, and the enfranchisement of the male Negro population forced a most difficult situation upon Mississippi and the other Southern states, and I am not willing by my vote to aid in increasing the burden which has been thrown upon them. So here's a, a, a Northern Senator from a state that has, what, you know, 500 to 1,000 uh, African Americans in them, in the state. I mean, not something you would think he would care a lot about, but he's, he's gonna vote kind of a white supremacist uh, approach to this. And um, so this is the dilemma that they faced. And I just, I thought that was an interesting letter and, and uh, you know, just helps to put it in, the issue in context. It, like I said, they've been working on this. They're now in their third generation, if you date it just from the 1848 Seneca Falls Conference. And um, they don't know when this is ever gonna pass. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's hard. All right, so let's move on. So Florence for a while is able to, to walk this kind of tightrope between the Maine Women's Suffrage Association and the main branch of the Congressional Union. And um, she does it pretty successfully, but then in October of 1916, Alice Paul hires her to go out to Wyoming as part of the strategy to hold the political party in power accountable. Um, she's gonna campaign in Wyoming against President Wilson, who was running under the slogan, he kept us out of war, and the suffragists went after him under the slogan, he kept us out of suffrage. They're tagging him uh, for not doing more to support suffrage. So she stops in Chicago on the way out, and here she is on the far right. Um, she's holding, she's helping to hold the sign. She's not here in the front. It's, it's right behind this woman in front. Um, their sign says, why does Wilson seek votes from women when he opposes votes for women? And um, they had led this procession out of suffrage headquarters and lined up all along this branch, uh, this block in, in Chicago. And this is only half the group. There's a whole other photo of women on the other end of the block. They stand there, say silent pickets. They're not saying anything until Wilson comes and enters the building. And then, I don't know if you can see, but there, there are all these men um, standing behind them and they just, out of nowhere, they attack them and they try to, they grab the signs from their hands and the, the women don't want to let go. They get thrown to the ground. Uh, their clothing is torn, their wrists are sprained. Florence goes over and talks to, the, I'm not sure if you can see with uh, where you're um, on the far right of your screen, but there's a mounted policeman. She appeals to him for help. He just laughs at her. And eventually they get chased back to suffrage headquarters and the crowd, the, the mob kind of stands outside and hassles them for hours. And then, um, but you know, this is kind of what they wanted, right? I mean, the next day, this is front page news all across the country. And, uh, and it's exactly what they wanted to bring attention to the fact that, that American women are denied voting rights. Um, so um, Florence goes on from there to Wyoming. She has a great time out there. And um, so she she's, uh, gets to travel around Wyoming for two or three weeks. She takes a side trip to Yellowstone, which has recently become a national park. And um, she just has a blast. And she sends back to the Lewis and Journal uh, an eyewitness account of this attack on these respectable middle-class women uh, who are brawling now on the streets of Chicago, which, my dear, they were never meant to do. And, um, and so by the time she finds her way back to Maine um, after the election, uh, her suffrage peers, her conservative suffrage peers in the Maine Women's Suffrage Association know exactly what she did, and, and they are not happy. And um, this is a mainly a problem because um, before she left Maine for Chicago and Wyoming, um, the, the, she, as chair of the legislative committee, had counted noses in the legislature, counted votes, and realized they actually had the votes finally to have the first ever statewide suffrage referendum in Maine. And so uh, they're really excited about this. Even though Carrie Chapman Catt, the, the president of uh, NASA, has advised them against this. She says, you're not ready, you don't have enough money, you don't have enough organizers, you have no idea how to run this campaign, you've never done it before, we want to concentrate our resources on states that, can, that really have a hope in hell of passing, and you're not it. But they are determined to move ahead, and they're just convinced that the good old state of Maine is not going to let them down. So eventually, Cat ends up lending 
NASA money from her own personal finances to help finance the campaign in Maine so that they won't make a completely disastrous showing. Um, so by the time Florence gets back to Maine, she's met with these, um, you know, she, she's told by her suffrage peers in MISA, you know what, you, you know, if you're lucky, we'll let you lick stamps and address envelopes, but you cannot have a, a public face or, you know, be part of the public face of this campaign for the uh, suffrage referendum because you're just way too controversial. And what ends up happening is that, um, you know, she's pretty put out by that and she's trying to figure out how she's going to respond. But in, what happens instead is that a bunch of her friends um, get together and form yet another suffrage organization they call the Equal Suffrage Referendum League. Um, and they, in absentia, kind of vote her to be president. And then they show up at her house and ask her if she'll accept. And she says, yes, I'd love to do that, actually. So that's how she gets to work on the 1917 suffrage referendum in Maine. Uh, it's under a completely different new organization that's put together just for that purpose. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to back up. So let me just talk about the, um, the, the timeline line here. The legislature approves the suffrage referendum in February. It's a long, cold winter, um, lots of snow, long, wet spring, lots of rain. Roads are really muddy. They can't really start their organizing outside of the major cities until the roads dry up. And so they're kind of stuck. And then in April of 1917, of course, the US enters the war, World War I. And um, all of the NASA members across the country were urged to join the war effort. And, and they were supposed to be working on suffrage too. But I think in large part, a lot of them just gave up on suffrage and, um, and just, you know, they'd roll bandages or knit socks for war orphans or raise money for the Red Cross. And Florence, actually joined the Red Cross in Portland and, and heads up their information bureau. It turns out to be a very key position for the Red Cross, and she's instrumental in, in, in facilitating communication between, between families and the servicemen um, who've, gone, who've gone to fight. Uh, because, of course, there's no VA then, um, and there's no other mechanism for, for, there's nobody else doing that. And so it's really a key position. And both her two older sons go ahead and enlist in the war effort. Um, they both end up in the Air Force. One flew bombers and one flew dirigibles. Um, and uh, both of them made it back from the war. But it was a very difficult time. So here she is. You know, they've got this suffrage referendum they've been working on for years, for decades. And finally, they get it. But it's kind of like, you know, all of a sudden they're in World War I and everybody's busy doing that work. And so it's not really until June. Um, that they get started on suffrage organizing, and the, the vote is, in set, is set in September, for September 10th. So um, they, they have a lot of work to do, and they don't have a lot of money because all of these women who said, oh, I'm going to work full-time for suffrage, uh, I'm just, you know, or I'm going to work part-time, and I'm going to give all my money, my extra money, to the suffrage campaign. They do this massive pivot to the war effort, and there's not a lot of money uh, for paying speakers or, or buying um, literature and, and sending that around. So it's, it's just a, a pretty tough go for them. But they get started, they do quite a bit of work in, um, in uh, July and August, and, and Florence actually sends a flag to the captain of the Nellie G who, that goes back and forth between Booth Bay Harbor and, um, and Squirrel Island and tells him, put this at the top of your mast where the aunties can't get at it, and if it wears out, I'll send you another one. Um, but she doesn't make it up to Squirrel that summer because she's too busy doing this organizing. So one of the things the Equal Suffrage Referendum League did was um, the, the White House has had a friend um, named Frederick Freeman who did these cartoons under the, the pen name Will Arcady. And um, so here's one example of this. They would put these in the newspapers and also post them in the, um, in the windows of their their temporary office on Congress Street at 662 Congress Street. So there's the Grange, the Federation, and good government who are, should be, you know, on the yes side of suffrage. Prejudice, vice, and the high cost of living are, are on the no side. Um, here's another one that's um, where the, the this uh, is a, the, the auntie's bogey, the women's places in the home is another junker for the scrap heap because look at these posters. 
eight million women are earning their living outside the home in the United States. President Wilson wants women to mobilize in, for industry and agriculture to help the war effort. And Lloyd George in London says allies can't win without women. So, you know, that, that whole thing of women belong in the home is just is ridiculous. And here's another one, uh, justice to women by national action. Um, Florence wearing that hat you saw, may have noticed earlier, is um, exchanging her political support uh, in, in, uh, for votes on the measure that she's, she's going after. So as if, as if it wasn't hard enough to be trying to run a suffrage campaign in, um, in the middle of a war, um, they, they're further uh, you know, challenged by the fact that the Congressional Union in January of 1917 begins picketing the White House, which has never been done before. And at first they just use these purple, white, and gold banners um, and, and stand outside the White House gates. But pretty soon they start um, adding messages and they'll say things like, Mr. You know, President Wilson, what will you do for women's suffrage or uh, things like that. And then later on they start using the president's own words. Um, and, and, and this one, this sign's a little hard to, to see, but it says, the time has come to conquer or submit for us, there is but one choice, and we have made it. So as President Wilson said that, they're throwing it back in his face because, of course, um, you know, they're making the same choice to fight him on this women's suffrage stuff, and that's Alice Paul holding that banner. Um, as time goes on, they get increasingly um, kind of mouthy, maybe is the best way to say it. Um, and here in this one, which came out in August, they used in August of 1917, they're comparing the sitting American president to Kaiser Wilson, with, you know, the German Kaiser, which there was so much anti-German sentiment at this time. It, it's like the height of the 50s and the Red Scare. And so they're, I mean, they're really putting themselves in danger of being prosecuted under the Espionage Act or this, this um, that has been passed by Congress in June at Wilson's behest. And, and um, so, but they just keep it up. And um, these headlines make, I mean, these, these, these events, because they start getting arrested too. By June, they're starting to get arrested. And through the summer, um, these arrests get, uh, head, you know, they're, they're making, front page headlines all over the country, including in Maine. And, and um, the Maine Women's Suffrage Association is really nervous about them because they, they think they're gonna, Maine is so stodgy and conservative, they think they're gonna tank the suffrage referendum. And, um, and that's kind of what ends up happening. Um, here's a Congressman Hersey from Maine, says bearers of the Kaiser Wilson banners have the highest motives, but, but he says they defeated suffrage in Maine. It lost two to one, it wasn't even close. Uh, so, um, you know, Florence and, and Robert both worked hard in the campaign. They put $1,000 of their own money into it, which was roughly $20,000 of today's money. It was a, a sizable stack of cash, and um, they couldn't have been happy with the result. What ends up happening is that Florence leaves Maine Women's Suffrage Association and says, I'm just going to work full time for the Congressional Union, and she does that which um, in late 1917 changes its name to the National Women's Party. So here's her new uh, letterhead. A fair exchange is no robbery, it says. And um, the main headquarters is now at their house, their new house, which is at 108 Bond Street in Portland's West End. So 1918, uh, 19, you know, 1918, 1919 are really busy on trying to, to put pressure on especially one main senator uh, to, to change his vote to yes in the Senate. But as, you know, they have yet another challenge, which is the, the flu epidemic in 1918, which we can totally sympathize with now. Um, this is actually a Portland Press Herald compilation they put together in 1998. Um, but you can see that, that there's, there's the cases balloon in October of 1918, um, and that they're, you know, it's, they're, it's, claiming lies all over the state and really interfering with her suffrage organizing um, and, and for the Congressional Union nationally as well. Um, so uh, I, I had mentioned actually that, that uh, Frederick Hale was the senator from Maine who, um, who had promised Florence he would vote the way Maine did in 1917 in that suffrage referendum. He would be bound by the outcome of that vote. 
Um, and so he decides he just cannot change his mind on that. He has to vote against it in Congress. But everybody knows he's not actually opposed to suffrage. So there's tremendous, tremendous scrutiny and, and pressure on Maine to turn him as they get down. The, it, it gets through the House. The House passes the, the federal amendment. Um, and then if they're down to you know 10 votes in the Senate. They just need five more, four more, three more. The pressure was excruciating. Um, but they can't ever turn turn hail. Um, but finally, it, it, they find the missing vote, and this in June of 1919. And um, this is the the telegram Florence sends to Alice Paul. And I apologize for the print, but it says, "Congratulations and rejoicing! Suffrage victory is due to you and your undaunted fate, splendid vision, and untiring devotion to the cause. I'm proud to be the lowliest of your disciples." So. What we know is it wasn't enough to pass it through Congress. Um, uh, you know, you have to get three quarters of the state to ratify. And in 1919, that was 36 states. And um, so finally, um, you know, there's a wave of states that, that pass it right away. And then, uh, you know, a lot of states have to, including Maine, have to be called back into special session. So that's difficult, especially if the governor isn't favorable. Um, so that takes a while. Maine eventually comes back and uh, gets brought into special session in November of 1919. And um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about it. We're kind of running out of time here, but um, uh, there's a big fight right at the end of Maine's ratification effort, and, and uh, it's, it's covered in my book. Um, ultimately, what you need to know is that Flor it's Florence and Alice Paul there at the bitter end up in Augusta, in the state house, making sure that it's a positive vote for the, the for ratification, and they get it through the Senate quite handily. But they only they their they, they their margin of victory is only four votes in the House. So without their last ditch efforts, I I think they might not have been successful. But Maine becomes the 19th state to ratify the 19th Amendment in November of 1919, and so here they are at the signing ceremony, and um, that's Governor Carl Milliken there. And Florence is standing behind him, uh, Grace, her buddy Grace Hill uh, to her right. And the other four women are all members of Maine Women's Suffrage Association. And, and from uh, to continuing around from right to left, it's Mabel Connor, Catherine Reed Ballantyne, Gertrude Pattengall, and Ann Gannett, who is married to Guy Gannett, um, the newspaper um, tycoon. And uh, so I, I want to draw your attention to the fact that. Uh, Carl Milliken here, Governor Milliken, is using a purple, white, and gold quill to sign the ratification. That was a quill that had been uh, had been created by the the National Women's Party and sent from state to state to be used in these signing ceremonies. And after the ceremony, well, and in, in, in doing this, I, I think he's really indicating that he knows who was responsible for this victory. And then after the ceremony, he gave all the women ceremonial uh, steel pens except for Florence, and he gave Florence a pearl-handled gold pen in special recognition of, of all the work that she did. So clearly he knows who was responsible for this suffrage victory in Maine. And here they are, I love this photo, they're on State Street in Portland, and the sign says, votes for women a success. And Florence is kind of right there in the middle of the car, <clears throat> you know, in a white, kind of a right raincoat there. So um, if you don't know, the language of the 19th Amendment, it reads, the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any states on account of sex. Um, and that took 72 years to pass, if you date it just from 1848, when the Seneca Falls Convention was held. But it, you know, hard won, not done. They, there were so many other battles to, to fight after that, including, uh, this is from 1921, Immediately, there were challenges. Well, okay, you know, the challenger said women can vote, uh, even though they litigated that too, but uh, they litigated the ratification. But here's a question, can women, uh, you know, hold civil offices in Maine? And they went to the Supreme Court on that question, and the Supreme Court said yes. So right out of the gate, they're, they're fighting battles around women's equality that have not stopped today. Um, just if you suffrage lineage, the National American Women's Suffrage Association becomes the League of Women Voters. So this is also their centennial this year. Um, 
And the Congressional Union uh, just continued its name, or National Women's Party just continued its name. It didn't need to change a name. And in 1923, Alice Paul writes and arranges to be introduced into Congress the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, which reads kind of is kind of similar to the 19th Amendment, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any states on account of sex. Um, so she, she it first introduced in 1923, it's not until 1972, two generations later, that Congress finally passes it. It has never been ratified. Not everybody knows that, um, but women are not equal in either the U.S. Constitution or the main Constitution, where simply our rights are not recognized in those foundational documents. Um, so just to finish up here, Florence goes on to do all kinds of other things after suffrage was won. Um, and among them, she returns to painting. Um, sadly, uh, uh, her husband dies in 1924, and uh, that really throws her for a loop for a while. But um, she rallies and she goes back to painting. As I said, she wrote another novel. Uh, she was really involved in um, the peace movement and had uh, a weekly radio address on WGAN in Portland. Uh, and um, joy, she was um, all kinds of, um, she advocated also for the League of Nations. Uh, she chaired Maine's branch of the Women's Committee on World Disarmament and represented the State Peace Commission on the World Unity Council among tons of other activities. Um, she also eventually joined the League of Women Voters. She wasn't there at the start. Um, she'd been kicked out around the referendum on cat's orders, but, um, but she ends up joining and, and taking over their legislative committee, of course. Um, what else would she do? So here's another of her paintings, and we, both of these are still in the family today. Uh, these are both of Monhegan. And, um, Here's a photo of her later in life with her um, middle son, um, Bobo, or Robert, Robert Tree. Um, and here she is uh, right around the time of her death. She died at, at 75. You know, I just wrapping up, I'd say her accomplishments would be impressive uh, today. If I knew her, I, I would think she was a pretty amazing woman. But against the backdrop of her own time and place, I think she's truly remarkable. Uh, I was first really captured by her suffrage activities, but then I came to realize that she did so many other things with her life. Uh, she lived a life of conscience and of principle, sometimes in the face of considerable hostility and opposition, and she held firm. She also balanced her causes with other passions for writing and painting, for music, um, for the you know for the love of her family. It seems to me that she had a very complete life, and that she would have viewed it that way as well. And I've always felt that she gave women permission to succeed in many spheres. And by her example, she challenges us to do that. And finally, she reminds me always that the work we do is women's work because we choose to put our hands to it and not because someone else defines it for us. So that concludes my uh, remarks, but I'm happy to take any questions that people have, either in the chat, oops, sorry, um, or um, or otherwise, actually, I, I died. I just wanted to, to give you this, um, this slide here as quote from Alice Paul, I never doubted that equal rights was the right direction. Most reforms, most problems are complicated, but to me, there is nothing complicated about ordinary equality and kind of that's where we are today. Thank you, Anne, very much for that talk. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing thinking back on what I was taught in school and how little of it, um, especially about this particular state's history, I was aware of. So it was very eye-opening, and, and I appreciate you doing that. Um, while we wait to see if anyone's going to be putting any uh, questions into the chat box, um, I had a question. Um, was this family history something that you, you were always aware of growing up? And if so, or if not, at what point in your life did you um, realize that this is kind of a, a subject matter that you wanted to pursue in the greater part of your life and in your career? You know, um, I am not a historian. Um, I'm, I'm, I wasn't trained in that. And I knew almost nothing about Florence or the suffrage movement until I was in my 40s. The one thing we know, or I was told growing up, is that she was a suffragist. She, she marched on Washington. 
and she uh, she was arrested and jailed for suffrage for, uh, for her picketing. You know, I, I, I've never been able to find any evidence of that, so that's just, it may just be one of those family myths that develops. Mm -hmm. I, but um, but it, it always seemed to me that, that when people talked about her, or at least my mom talked about her, it was with a kind of a curl of the lip in, in some ways, just like making fun of her for being a, a you know, a suffragist. And, and, and uh, it was not, it was not the, um, you know, adulation. <laughs> I would have thought, you know, most remarkable forebears get from their families because people simply didn't remember. And um, so, I, and when I dug up all this information about her mom was just floored. She had no idea that Florence had done all this cool stuff or, or that Robert had, and, um, and she had known them. So uh, it was, you know, it was, it was, um, or she'd known Florence, I guess her, her grandfather died before she was born. But uh, so I, I think it says to me that people should explore their, their backgrounds and histories and maybe you'll find somebody cool in your background too. And also that if you were involved in the Equal Rights Amendment fight or other women's rights fights, or in any other civil rights or you know social activism fights, you should tell your kids and your grandkids and let them know because Absolutely. Yeah. You know, they need to know this stuff. So what are some resources that you went to or that you would recommend to people um, to do more, you know, d dive a little deeper into this topic? Where did you go to find out this history? Um, there's a, one is called A Century of Struggle by Eleanor Flexner. Flexner. Um, and uh, that is kind of a great overview. Um, there's, there's a recent biography or a couple of recent biographies of Alice Paul, which are really good. And I'm, I'm blanking on the names of them. Um, there's a great book that Elaine Weiss wrote and published fairly recently, just in the last couple of years, um, um, called The Woman's Hour, which is about the final state to ratify, which was Tennessee, uh, which you you know, probably a lot of people have heard that story, uh, but it was it was just an incredible battle, and and you can really see the forces that are brought to bear um, from all quarters against the the federal amendment and the ratification at that point, and um, it just will it's just jaw dropping. So and and that I think is going to be made into um, a mini series or something. I, apparently. Uh, Hillary Clinton is advising on that, so mm -hmm. keep your eyes tuned for that. There is also um, American Experience uh, and PBS um, in early, earlier this month released something called The Vote. Um, so look for that. I think there's two, it's four hours, you know, two two-hour sessions. But um, if you have uh, main public, uh, you know, if you're a member of main public, you can find it there. Um, and, and find it online as well. So that, and that's great because of course, you get all the, the photographs and, and um, talking heads and things like that um, if, if you're not as into reading or don't have the time. That's true. And again, as, as a uh, library employee, we aim to get copies of all of these things after the series are complete. So please do also check with your local libraries. Um, we've had a couple questions come in. Um, the first one is, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, what were the sources of inspiration and strength for Florence Brooks White House, if you happen to know, if she comments on that in any maybe of her diaries? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I, there's one woman that I know she mentions, um, Augusta Hunt, uh, who lived at 165 State Street, and her husband was a wealthy businessman, um, did uh, sugar importing, I think. And Augusta Hunt, she just says at one point is was you know behind every progressive social movement for women um, over the last you know 50 years or something like that. And and uh, and uh, so I think certainly she has a lot of respect for Augusta. She really had a lot of respect for Alice Paul, and um, and she had a funny relationship with her. Alice Paul was always like just the facts, ma'am. You know, all business. Uh, she was not a not a hangy outy kind of person, but uh, Florence always wrote to her in a very familiar style, and you could tell that she just really was impressed by her. So um, she's always, you know, writing her and asking her for advice on different things that are happening in Maine. Um, I think her husband was a big help as well as her her um, her father in law too was a big suffrage supporter. So uh, having the men in the family on board was huge for her, especially when things got really tough. Um, in 1917 and onward.
Yes, having that immediate family support is essential when you're undertaking such a massive task. Um, we have another question. This one's from Tiffany. It says, what a great life, life and story. How did you find that amazing photo from Chicago, question mark, um, anti-Wilson protests, and how did you discover that she was in the photo? Well, I can recognize her in the photo, but um, um, my sister actually found it um, in the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress has the papers of the National Women's Party and uh, the National American Women's Suffrage Association. So uh, I was able to get on microfilm um, sent up to Portland those pa the correspondence from those papers, and I just went through them all from 1912 to or 13 to, to 1920. Uh, took me a while. Um, this is why it took me 15 years to research and write this book, you know, while I was doing other things like raising my own kids and running a business and things like that. Uh, but they, and so uh, part of the archives that they have there are these wonderful photographs and, and they had put this up online. Um, you can, so you can find there's, um, it's called Women of Protest, I think. If you Google that in the uh, Library of Congress, you can, you can, there aren't that many other photographs like this one. Um, a lot of them are just individuals um, in, in their, you know, prison garb or things like that. Um, but there, there are some sort of action photos of, of, of women speaking to crowds. Um, that is all the questions that we have coming in right now. If anyone has a, a last question, go ahead and type it in right now. And while we just wait one more minute for that. Oh, here, here's one right here. <laughs> it says, race was cited in the news clip citing a member of the main congressional delegation. But is there any record of Florence's own reflections on race, role of black and or native women in quest for women's suffrage? That is such a good question. And the answer is, I just don't know. I, I've never been able to find anything in her papers that uh, suggests that she was, you know, had one position or another. Um, she, um, you know, I just, there's, it's just completely blank. Uh, I do know, uh, I mean, there's no evidence that she reached out to any organized um, black suffrage organization in Maine, but I don't think one existed because I spent some time over the last year looking for one and I, I, I've never heard of it. And, and I contacted black historian or, you know, historians who, who've researched the black community in Maine and um, they weren't familiar with that either. So I don't know that there was a group for her to work with in Maine, um, but she did work she did more than any other suffrage leader of her era anyway to reach out to labor and uh to try to get um to to try to get um you know kind of ally the suffragists with the labor movement around things like the eight hour work day um and she, she doesn't spend a huge amount of time on that but definitely in 1915 1916 she's working on that kind of stuff Okay. We had another question come in. It says, I understand that white Southern congressmen did not want to expand suffrage to more African Americans, but why do you think Northern men, such as Maine Senator, did not want to burden Southern states? I think it's racism. Um, I, you know, they, they also hid behind the fig leaf of, of states' rights quite a bit. Um, and, it, you know, I call it a fig leaf, but I mean, there are people who are quite passionate about it, as we know. Uh, but there was precedent for enfranchising black men and fall after the Civil War uh, through federal uh, through a federal amendment, and um, so you know there was a plenty of precedent for doing the same for women. Uh, but you know there, I, I, one of the things that's kind of hard to hold in your mind these two thoughts at the same time. But um, you know it's possible it was possible to be anti-slavery, for example, and still be racist. And, and I mean, so you could you could think that blacks should not be slaves, but you sure didn't want them to vote or to to move in next door or marry your daughter, or or vote possibly. So I think there were plenty of people who bought into the inferior race uh, idea, and um, and that was um, so. I guess my point is that that the suffragists of the time um, may very well have been racist, but they were no more racist than the country as a whole, and. You know, over the years that, on decades and generations that women worked on suffrage, they had to overcome, um, you know, uh, uh, barriers or obstacles in in law, in culture, and in religion. And um, it, one of the reasons I think suffrage took so long is that it 
well, women's suffrage did is that because they had so many barriers and so many different areas of women's lives. And the same was true of, of blacks. I mean, they had, they, you know, they were, came in servitude as slaves and they were considered property. They were half, you know, in, under a constitution, they were considered like half a person. And um, so it took a really long time for that change to, you know, for, for activists and, and, you know, to change that uh, sense of that understanding of who blacks actually were. And um, it just took time. And, and so the, the suffragists had to decide, do we join forces with them and make that our cause too, and delay suffrage ratification that much longer? Um, or do we, you know, basically say, we're gonna focus just on women's suffrage and, and we'll use the suffrage to try to get at black stuff, you know, black rights later, uh, and some did and some didn't, just like happens today. Yeah, and I, I had recently watched a, um, a little mini series on Hulu, uh, Mrs. America, and it shows, you know, the equal rights struggle going into the 60s and, and how there was the overlap between the women's rights struggle and the uh, struggle for equal rights for African Americans. And then even more difficult if you are a black woman, you know, or a black gay woman. And, and I was glad that they touched on that um, and, and brought some light to that as well. But yeah, that's a great series. I haven't finished it yet, but it's it's absolutely chilling. And um, and Kate Blanchett does a terrific job as as Phyllis Schlafly. Yes, well, I I'm, I'll spoil it for you. The ERA is not ratified. <laughs> yeah, I already made that point. Uh, <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> in okay. fact, I, I just want to point out that it's still a live issue in Maine, the Maine Equal Equal Rights Amendment. And in the last session where it was voted on, which was in 2019. Uh, every Democrat voted for it, and every Republican voted against it. Oh. So if you have a Republican legislator in your district, you need to have a conversation with that person. Women, you know, eventually they'll get back to meeting in Augusta and acting on things again, so. Yes, and thank you so much. Um, so Sue thanks you also. She says that she really enjoyed this presentation, and that is about all the time that we have today for this presentation, but I did want to point out um, that we have another talk coming up that uh, speaks to women's issues. We're going to be having on August 6th, Thursday, August 6th, I believe is the date, at 6 p.m. We're gonna be having a conversation with two young female journalists from Courier Publications, and they are going to discuss how their gender, how their age, and how their past experiences have, um, have sort of taken them on this course into journalism and what they've gone through to get to where they are today. So yes, if you're interested in that program, um, please email me at the same address from which I sent you the link to this program. It's J Pierce, J-P-I-E-R-C-E at librarycampton.org and you can join us for that talk as well. Um, thank you, Anne, so very much. I appreciate you doing this talk. I learned a lot and I'm absolutely certain that everyone who joined us today did too. Um, again, if you enjoyed this, please share it with your friends and family. We're going to be putting it on the Camden Public Library's YouTube channel. Um, and if you would like a link to that, you can email me as well. Um, thank you again, Anne, so much. Thank you. I really appreciate everybody uh, joining tonight. It was a lot of fun. Have a wonderful rest of your night, folks. Bye-bye. Yep, bye-bye.